thank the organizers, Hossein and Pierre, for the honor uh, of uh, uh, inviting me here in such a very distinguished company of uh, uh, very distinguished lecturers, which, uh, of course, is very humbling for me, especially considering that I'm going to, <coughs> to talk about uh, optimal control before one of the founding fathers of quantum optimal control, which is sitting in the last row, which is Hirsch Rabbit, and I'm sure she is going to, to give a, <coughs> you know, a very comprehensive overview of the field in these lectures. So what I am going to do is I'm going to uh, tell a few stories. It's also uh, it's night, so I have to keep you awake. So more than you know, having more formulas or uh, some some systematic treatment, I'm going to tell you a series of stories which have the purpose of introducing you in the in these ideas of uh, optimal control. So the topic of this school is quantum control of mesoscopic systems. And I am going to talk about one specific <coughs> you know, approach to control, which is optimizing control. I will define what that is. Um, and of quantum systems from very little to very big. Um, <coughs> I have one problem that normally I speak very fast. Uh, and I tend to overload my talks. So I have started with a good uh, resolution. It is also New Year, it is uh, not uh, long ago. So I had a good resolution that I would stay within 30 uh, transparencies per hour, which is very, very low rate. It is less than half what I normally do. Then, I mean, while I was sitting in the, in the last row, I was starting to put some, maybe we need something more. Now I'm at 110. I hope it doesn't escalate that much more. I will try to talk very slowly. <coughs> OK. And um, uh, what else? Yeah, there is another remark about YouTube, <coughs> right? Because uh, Pierre said we are going to count hits. So the first part of my talk uh, is something that uh, I gave uh, recently, well, now a little less than one year ago, in front of 15 million viewers on Russian television, okay? So those were not hits, of course, but still, uh, you know, uh, uh, I hope it, the level is general and broad enough for, for students. And now, <coughs> before I start, here comes a very important picture, uh, at least very important for me. My son, you see, he was in the last row, told me that if you Google my name, uh, uh, apart from um, uh, some not so fascinating picture of my bald head, uh, one of the uh, images in Google Images that you find is going to be this image because it is very dear to me, and you will understand soon why this is the case because this is a <coughs> very clear indication of a non trivial task that you can perform using control abilities. And this is pre Photoshop, this is a picture by Alfred Eisenstein, 1942. So, this uh, speed up device here, here on, the, on, the, on the tray. Uh, sit some champagne glasses, okay, we'll comment on that later. There is a speed up device on ice here, which allows for fast transport of some uh, fluid. Uh, and this is pre-Photoshop, so it is a real thing, and we comment on how you can uh, do that, and how you can learn from that to control quantum systems. <coughs> so here comes the outline of what I want to, to say. Well, the first motivation for this in the few body vision came for me, for, from the interest in implementing quantum information, quantum technology devices. So like uh, little quantum gates uh, or quantum computing, I will describe what that means, how that relates to these AMO systems that have been dealt with also in the previous um, lectures, and how you can use control ideas in order to do the best possible device that you can obtain. So <clears throat> this brings me to discuss what is Controllability of quantum systems. Again, Hirsch will talk probably much more in a much more qualified way uh, about that. So here is my pedestrian approach to controllability. It is about quickly shaking little bit things so that you can achieve your goal better and faster. I will show how you can do that in classical control and also in quantum control. And then, of course, normally, you know, I'm one of few theoreticians speaking here. So normally, if you're a theoretician, you have bright ideas, of course, and then you go to the experimentalist, your friend, or at least you think he or she is your friend. And you say, yeah, what a great idea. And what do the experimentalists do? Of course, they will start complaining. Okay, they say, oh, yes, but your pulse shape is not so good. It's too complex. You know, my system, in the end, I don't know what is in my experimental chamber. Actually, this is a comment which Bill Phillips made to me when we were doing one of, preparing one of the papers that I will show. And at some point, Bill said, but Tommaso, actually, I do not know what really the optical lattice and the field is in my experimental chamber. Can you give me a, a, a control that works nevertheless? And of course, I mean, if it was not Bill, uh, so if it was a slightly less qualified person, I would not have taken very seriously this comment. But of course, I had to take it very seriously. 
And so <coughs> this is one of a list of complaints that uh, we can fix using control ideas. So a list of what, what can go wrong in such systems and how you can fix it um, one by one. And then once you can do that, <coughs> this is probably going to be the, um, the last of my three lectures, how you can <coughs> take control of quantum devices and push it to the limit. Get the most that you can get in terms of fidelity of quantum processes, in terms of speed of processes, and in terms of size. So from the microscopic to the macroscopic potential or mesoscopic at least. So this is the, the whole outline of what I'm going to <coughs> discuss. And the first thing is what we need if we want a, a scalable quantum system for quantum processing purposes. Which means really I'm going from the microscopic, I have a few atoms, few ions, I want to build something big. Be it a quantum network, complex network of quantum communication, be it a quantum processor or a quantum simulator with many, many particles and, and qubits and quantum bits. So <clears throat> here are some slides that I borrowed, or I should say now stole, from Peter Zoller, borrowed when he was still my boss in his group. Now uh, I should maybe more properly say um, stole from him. But they are very clear. I, I, uh, I used them for several years to introduce this, uh, this topic. And <clears throat> so basically, what do you have when you have a quantum processor? You want to process some quantum information. So you start with some quantum bits. And those quantum bits, this is a quantum register, it is <clears throat> should be a memory, a quantum memory, in the sense that you know, each of these individual quantum systems, which are quantum bits in terms of being two-level systems, they could be, for instance, spin one-half systems, what you want from this is that this is a good memory so that the quantum state stays there for a long time with a low decoherence rate. And this quantum register, you can put, the advantage of it is you can put it in an arbitrary superposition of different such states. Meaning, if I have only one qubit, I could have the usual superposition alpha zero plus beta one, very trivial, which I can present on my block, sphere, and so on and so forth. If I start having two qubits, uh, a very small quantum register of two elements, I can have some two qubit entangled state. And this starts being less trivial because of some of the states that I can have here, like for instance, zero zero plus one one, this is, uh, uh, or 0, 0, mm, mm, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, if you like, the singlet state. This is the EPR state. Actually, it is not the original EPR state because, as we learned from Jeff, this is in momentum uh, and, and position. But <coughs> it is an entangled state, a singlet state, which is equivalent to uh, the original EPR state. It is the state based on which such wonderful experiments on value inequalities have been performed. And this is a state which is a basis for a series of quantum processing tasks, like, for instance, teleportation, but also secure communication, and so on. And if you have such entangled state, and I mean, where does it come from? It comes from the possibility of having you know, more than one component in what we call the computational basis state, the basis state, the states, which are all possible combinations, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, and so on and so forth, binary numbers that they can encode in these qubits, superimposed onto one another with complex coefficients, they give rise to entanglement, to the fact that I cannot write this state in a separable way, which was what was bugging Einstein, as we learned this afternoon, and which is one of the reasons why quantum mechanics can be so powerful in terms of technological applications. So if I start with such a quantum register, I can put it in an arbitrary superposition of, um, of many such states. This is something that looks, uh, uh, of course, is very mysterious, but uh, it is something that uh, can be uh, understood by politicians. Actually, recently I was uh, in the, uh, the European Commission lobbying for, for some uh, funding for, the, um, for our field. And one argument that uh, well, I was able to sell to such uh, you know, uh, politicians, which you know, in the end decide how much money is going to come to us, was that, OK, if I have uh, here a <coughs> mega byte, okay, I can save one picture of uh, anything. And then if I want to save another picture in another mega byte, Okay. If I have a quantum uh, mega qubyte, I can save on that mega qubyte SD card, I can save at the same time all possible one megapixel pictures that I can take. Of course, then there is a trick, which normally I also even explain to politicians that you cannot you know, read at the same, retrieve at the same time all of those 
um, pictures because you know if you measure you will get one result one possible combination of your qubits but still there can be an advantage in creating such a superposition in that if I now can do a manipulation using a unitary transformation that takes my quantum bits and processes them in a coherent way in the end I will get an output state which can contain the result of such computation if you wish for all possible initial computational basis states for all possible inputs and then there can be some clever procedures some quantum algorithms that allow me to extract some interesting information even though I cannot of course read the whole superposition with a single measurement but there are algorithms like for instance we know Shor's algorithm for factorizing numbers uh, like we know um, Grover's algorithm for, for quantum search that allow us with a clever choice of this manipulation to get in the end a desired answer for instance by a projective measure and so I can use this quantum parallelism in order to obtain some interesting tasks and <clears throat> this is the basis the basic idea of why quantum processing is interesting by the way we now know that uh, quantum computing I mean is there since several years and people start wondering okay but will it ever be realized in this form of like generic algorithm but there um, we also know that one specific example of a quantum computer a quantum simulator was the actually the original idea which Richard Feynman had proposed for a quantum processor and a quantum simulator I will come back to that later is a device that allows me to learn to calculate properties for instance of a many body quantum system that I could not calculate with a classical computer and this maybe again seems very uh, mysterious but again this is something that I was able to explain to politicians in the following sense that last year we had one very important breakthrough because we don't yet have a, a quantum computer that can do universal quantum computation that can outperform any classical computer but we do have a quantum simulator that does something that no classical computer can do what is that? this is an experiment based on optical lattices which was performed by Manuel Bloch in Munich so there they are doing this simulation which is basically a spin model that is modeled by atoms in optical lattices I'll come back to, uh, to that later and what you do is for a certain number of quantum bits you can simulate such experiment by a uh, so-called tensor uh, network methods uh, on a classical supercomputer and so they did a simulation of some spin model with a classical supercomputer in Jülich, in Germany the biggest supercomputer we have in, in uh, Europe by the way, at the moment the biggest supercomputer in the world can calculate can simulate exactly the behavior of a quantum computer up to 42, 43 quantum bits okay? If you now want to go from 43 to 44 quantum bits, you need to buy another supercomputer that big. Okay? You need to double the size because the size of Hilbert space grows exponentially the number of qubits. If you want to do 45, you need three more supercomputers. Okay? So there is a limit to what you can calculate with these classical computers. Now, what happened is they used this supercomputer to simulate classically the evolution of a spin system that Immanuel Bloch could implement in his lab and now you see that there are some oscillations in some effective magnetization that um, you actually right now and I'm thinking of it I should have put this uh, but this would have been one slide more and probably not to increase too much so but you can see the, the simulation from the classical computer you know, which reproduces some oscillations up to a certain point in time and at that point the thing collapses because accuracy from classical simulation is no longer sufficient and you see up to that point the quantum simulator that goes nicely on top of it meaning it works and at some point you know the classical computer gives up no more possible and the quantum computer goes on okay and this is the first evidence that we have of really a quantum processor that is doing something that no classical computer on earth can ever possibly be doing okay so we have it we do have the quantum computer it is not the generic one, it is not the factoring quantum computer, but we do have the quantum computer that does something that no classical computer can do. And so there is a big motivation 
to try and implement it. So now let's see <coughs> how that could work. If I look inside this box, um, I will realize that this general n qubit transformation <coughs> can be decomposed. You see here, so those are lines representing qubits evolving in time, and I can decompose the big box in smaller boxes. One qubit transformation, single qubit boxes, and boxes that couple two such qubits. And those work as follows. A single qubit gate is, if you wish, just a rubbing notation. It was introduced in the first, very first talk this morning, so that was very useful also for setting the stage for, for <coughs> what I am going to talk about. And this, of course, is not producing any entanglement because it talks to every qubit separately. But now, I want also to get some entanglement. So I want some two qubit operation, which is what then I will try to implement by my control operations. And here I can, for instance, be happy if I manage to get one specific type of control operation, which is so-called control knot. Very simple. I have one control qubit which stays unchanged. And the so-called target qubit, the other qubit in this two-qubit transformation, gets inverted if the first control qubit, acting like a switch, is in the state one. So you see here, if the first qubit is in the state zero, nothing happens to the second qubit. <coughs> if the first qubit is in the state one, second qubit gets inverted from zero to one and from one to zero. And of course, my purpose is to have such an operation, not just for every single component here, but working for any arbitrary superposition of those states. And this is the goal that I had in the first part, at least, of my lecture here. So how do we realize that? Again, here come relevant what was discussed uh, today, which is, uh, you know, these atomic systems, you can manipulate them, for instance, by interaction with, uh, with the electromagnetic field, by a, um, uh, laser pulses, and so you can induce radio rotations between logical states, and so you can use your atoms as qubits, and your qubit states as electronic, for instance, highly fine states. They should be long-lived in the sense that in the back of our mind we should remember this should be, you know, a call to memory, should last for a very long time. Um, and you can manipulate them via, via some, uh, some external field. And of course, you need to be able to address them individually, which is where control becomes important, which is why some of our friends, maybe not as many as would have deserved, uh, got uh, a very important uh, recognition in Stockholm recently, because uh, the motivation of that Stockholm recognition said uh, manipulation of single quantum systems, opening the way, I mean, laying down the basis for what we are going to talk about in this school. You know, <coughs> controlling mesoscopic systems based on individual um, quantum degrees of freedom control. So this is one important requirement that, that we have there for single operations. And now, if we want to do the two qubit part, then <coughs> we want also to be able to control interactions between our qubits. So we want, at a certain point in time, here again time is flowing from, uh, from down to up, at some point I want to have these two uh, quantum bits interact in a state dependent way. I will show why this is necessary because they want to achieve entanglement. So, if I have some interaction between those two quantum bits, and if this interaction is dependent of the, on, on the internal state, like I have some energy shift that they can induce in some way onto my system based on the internal state, based on the qubit state of those two systems. After I switch on and off this energy, I will accumulate a certain phase in the wave function here. And this phase, because the interaction energy depends on internal states, this phase will be accumulated only for a certain combination of internal states. So for instance, from a state 0, 1, plus 1, 0, I can go to a state 0, uh, 1, minus 1, 0 or even from a non-entangled state, I can go to an entangled state by using such phases here, okay? And this is the basis of how I can take a physical system and create the building blocks that allow me to have entanglement and to do quantum processing. 
including not only quantum computing, but also quantum communication and other things like, like uh, sensing, like, uh, uh, you know, things that are important for, for uh, clock synchronizations with applications on GPS and so on. So we're not talking only about quantum computing here. We are talking about all technologies that are enabled by manipulation and control of single quantum systems. And here comes also a very important feature, which is the basis of my optimal control discussion, which is this little parenthesis here with a time <coughs> sign. It is a time dependence of something. Here it is a, a, an energy difference that I should be able to control in some way. And what I am going to talk about is, you know, in a lot of examples, if you wish, very specific, very narrow-minded. I am going just to try and choose the best possible um, time dependence shape of my control parameter to achieve the goal that I have. Okay? This is what all my three hours of lecture are about. So <clears throat> let's go on and see what is my goal. So what does it mean, the best possible time dependence? Okay? In the case of quantum computing and communication, there are some criteria that my system would need to satisfy. And those are known as the Vincenzo criteria because they were formulated first in a paper by David Vincenzo like 12 years ago. So what we want here is a system of well-characterized qubit, <coughs> a scalable system. And this means, really, scalable means I, can, I know how to do a few, and then I'm able to do many, which is this connection between microscopic and macroscopic, which is in the title itself of, of this uh, um, uh, winter school, which is mesoscopic physics. I want to be able to prepare them in a very well-defined state, zero state, let's say, certain high-defined state, if they are atoms, for instance. As I mentioned before, I want that the coherence takes much longer than the operations that I can do here, and I want to be able to do a set of quantum gates, which is universal in terms of what I said before single and two qubit gates at least, and then I want to be able to measure. This is valid both for a quantum computer that does you know, this factoring a la short algorithm, and it is valid also with some small modifications also for quantum simulation. Now, if I want to do quantum communication, I have two additional requirements. Interconversion between my memory qubits, like atoms. Atoms are good, they sit there. They can store quantum information for long, but if I throw an atom to you, when you catch, by the time you catch it, probably the quantum state is a little bit uh, deteriorated. Instead, I can throw a photon at you, okay? And this photon will come with very good fidelity. You can get the photo that I, I threw, even if you sit at a few hundred kilometers from where I am. There are experiments which have shown that. And now the problem is how we convert these things. How, when I, I throw some information at you, how can you save it in, in order for it not to be, to be lost instantly. And, <clears throat> of course, I also need to have some good quantum channel which can transmit faithfully such photonic state, and this happens only for certain distances, up to certain distances, and so on and so forth. So, for each of these criteria, I have specific requirements that follow on physical systems. And what I am going to focus on as I said before, is some time dependencies of some controls that enable to fulfill those criteria in the best possible way, satisfying the requirement of fault tolerance, meaning that all of these operations need to be done with very, very high quality, very high fidelity, so that the whole system can work. So and here is well, this is the most uh, probably the most uh, formula dense uh, transparency. I'm putting it here because it is still in the beginning, and then I promise there will be many more stories and other things and less formulas. So, <clears throat> but I'd like you to uh, kind of uh, see it because most of my life in the last uh, maybe ten years has been devoted to uh, the purpose of making this number f as big as possible. Maybe, I mean, this can be very narrow-minded if you like, but uh, I'm, my fun is coming from the fact that I'm doing this for a lot of different systems, and I will tell you stories for all, all these different systems, including, uh, I mean, this theory applies to basically virtually all the systems that are discussed experimentally during this winter school. So, 
This is one example of something that I want to perform in terms of quantum field. So I start with the, my initial state of uh, two qubits, okay, which is an arbitrary superposition somehow of all possible combinations, <coughs> 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, with arbitrary coefficients here. Now, I start with this uh, superposition here, and I would like to get something that is uh, a perfect two qubit gate, meaning that, for instance, I can have some very well defined phases here, okay, which after my operation come and multiply each of the components of my state. So I want to achieve some very specific phases due to my dynamics that I manipulate. <coughs> Do something, you know, black magic, out come some phases, and I want those to be some specific combination so that, for instance, these combinations, so those phases, 500, 501, 1, 0, and 1, 1, they have to satisfy a certain dimension <coughs> among them. So if this particular combination here, this nonlinearity basically the phase is equal to pi, then I have an entangling gate. Otherwise, if it is different than pi, I have something which is not so good. Okay? And then we come back also to that uh, later, probably tomorrow. Bad luck, I do not only have this internal state. Because before I said, okay, I want some energy difference that depends on my internal states. But I didn't specify how I can achieve that. And to achieve that, I have to do some manipulation. I have to move my qubits around. I have to shuttle around in an optical lattice, for instance, my atoms, whatever. I'll discuss that in, in detail later. But this means that I do not only have the, the um, internal state, but here should be, I mean, there is on my computer, but not on the screen, a tensor product sign. I also have some external degrees of freedom, okay? And so this makes for a um, density matrix representing my state, which in the beginning is factorized. There is no entanglement between internal and external degree of freedom. But after the actual evolution that my experimental friends can perform, and here come the complaints, okay? Because they say, you wanted some ideal dynamics, but what we get is not really ideal. It is something that we can do in the, in the experiment. So in the end, I get some density matrix, which is no longer factorizable among these two components. And so in the end, I'm asking, OK, how close did I get to what I wanted? I wanted some very specific you know, um, transformation, which would be uh, you know, based on, on this state here. I wanted to obtain this state here, chi tilde. How much of that did I get? Well, I take the density matrix that I obtained, I project it onto the ideal state that I wanted, and then there are these external degrees of freedom that I have no idea uh, and no control in the end what they are. Could be motion of my atoms if it is an atomic gate. And so the only thing I can do is I take an average. I trace over those degrees of freedom. And this gives me my fidelity. So if I include the environment, okay, this gets easily quite complicated. So even though it is one single number, which is the purpose of my life here, then calculating it in a, in a specific problem can get very tricky. And optimizing, meaning finding the uh, time dependence for all my parameters that makes sure that this number is the biggest possible can be even more tricky. So we have to, I mean, this is very general, but we have to look at it in some specific examples to understand what it means. <coughs> and <coughs> so this is why we start with some specific systems. We have some wishes that we have to fulfill, that we want a quantum register with many qubits, which stays coherent for a long time. And we also want to be able to do our quantum gates quickly and with lowest possible error. And so, one very natural candidate for that is AMO systems. Okay, so especially ultra cold systems. Why? Because you can isolate <coughs> the environment, you can control atoms individually, as they learned also in Stockholm. You can have periodic potentials, uh, for instance, optical lattices, which hold atoms. And those atoms can be held in an optical lattice in a state dependent way. What does this mean? It means that I can have two components before it was 0 and 1, internal states, 
Now I call those internal states red and blue, and I can have a potential which is different for atoms in state zero than it is for atoms in state one. And then if I have that, which I will show in the next transparencies how I can realize, if I have that, I can do the following process. I can move back and forth one of the components, <coughs> and whenever a blue atom from the left goes and talks to the red atom to the right, I am going to have to realize this interaction that I wanted. So here there is a collision, there is an interaction only for a certain combination of internal states. As I promised before, when I said I want a certain quantum gate, how do I get that? I get that by having a, a certain energy which varies with time, but only for a certain combination of internal so here what happens in this dynamics is that only the combination 1, 0 has this interaction energy that can give me such entanglement. <coughs> but again, here I have not only, as I showed in the previous transparency, my internal degree of freedom, 0, 1, red, blue, I also have the external one, which is the motion, the vibration here. And so this is what will, you know, make my, my gate dirtier, more difficult, because I can do it in an easy way, in an adiabatic way, or I can do it quicker, which is better, because they want fast gates, but then I, it gets messed up. And this is where my waiter comes in, okay, because I have to transport something which is actually, you know, uh, a liquid. It's not just a point particle. It's a wave function. A wave function, I mean, is sloshing around if you move. Okay. And so here comes my waiter with his tray of glasses and fast transport of these glasses and fast because I want fast operation but also I want high fidelity. I want all my champagne to reach the goal. Okay? And this is where my optimal control comes in. So uh, if you have not gotten that, it will be even more boring for the rest because this is the whole uh, motivation here. <coughs> so maybe, uh, well, uh, I know in Germany it is almost impossible to bring students to ask any questions um, unless you, 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 you whip them, you, 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 you beat them with the whip, or unless you use your authority as the professor, because professor, of course. Yeah. But um, here maybe it is easier to bring you, even though time is late, to uh, make sure that everybody is following and to ask questions if not clear. Maybe it is so trivial that they should go twice as fast or three times as fast because everybody doesn't do that. <laughs> so, if you want to show me that I should not go much faster, please ask for clarification. How does this thing know which direction the blue and the red? Oh, excellent. So here comes the answer. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> okay, so, um, well, well, let's say I hope that at least the motivation here is, is clear, but I will go back to that later. So we refer again to this initial uh, discussion. So how does the thing know? Because you can create trapping potentials for atoms using light, uh, using, <coughs> for instance, a field, you know, a certain uh, radiation detuned from a certain transition <coughs> can give you a modulation in the, in the energy, a dependence of the energy um, of your atom on the intensity of the uh, laser. And so if you modulate the intensity of your laser, for instance, by using an optical lattice, which is to counter propagating lasers, they form an interference pattern, so uh, intensity goes up and down, okay? And since the energy of an atom, here is a, an energy level scheme uh, for this atom, an energy of an atom coupled to radiation with a certain polarization here, a certain frequency, depends on the uh, intensity of the radiation, the atoms could be trapped, for instance, in minima of this potential, or they could be trapped in maxima, okay? But giving a spatial modulation allows you to have a certain, um, a certain potential that varies with with the space, and so you can trap atoms in there. So this is how we trap atoms in optical lattices. Now, the potential depends on some coupling of your external field 
which you know is talking to some of the internal states here and thereby creates those AC star shifts. And this depends also on um, since I mean the laser is coupling to some internal transitions of the atom, it depends also on polarization, for instance. Okay? So if I have a circularly polarized light in um, uh, sigma plus in the uh, clockwise direction, this will couple to a certain you know uh, angular momentum change in my atomic state. Okay? And so I can have two different circularly polarized components in my optical lattice which talk to different uh, levels. One, I can find situations in which basically one of the levels is sensitive only to one of the uh, polarization components and the other one <coughs> is sensitive only to the other one. So if I pick my logical states as such levels, I can have two different potentials, a red and a green potential for the two different internal states. Those can be, for instance, hyperfine states. Yeah. In. Are they connected? For oh no, no. Here they are connected. No, this is not. I mean, connecting in the sense that it indicates that they can have some coupling. I can fire, for instance, uh, a Raman transition that has a certain Raman frequency that tells me in which time I can I can perform this uh, single qubit operation. Okay. So, and one thing is I need to have this coupling to do the single qubit operations, and the other thing I need to have this uh, coupling to some internal levels in order to be able to displace, to move, to change the shape of my potential with time. And again, this is something that I can change with time. It is something where I will use my optimal control. Okay? Because this movement can be achieved by changing some laser parameters. In this case, since we are talking about a circular polarization, I can have two linearly polarized lasers and they move the angle and so displace the circular polarization components. And therefore, I can obtain basically what I showed before in, in my cartoon. So, <clears throat> how do I get the, my, my quantum gate? This is what I showed in the cartoon before. So, I start with uh, some atom <coughs> in the ground state localizing one of these wells of this potential for both internal states. Then I displace both and then I come back. And such a state dependent dynamics can give rise when two atoms talk, cross, talk to each other, gives rise to a state-independent dynamics exactly of the type that I showed on the previous, uh, on one of the initial slides. So each time a left zero atom and a right one atom meet, they acquire a certain phase, and if this phase is pi, then I can have maximal entanglement for them. So this is basically taking atoms and making them collide by hand, if you wish, on top of one another in such a way that you obtain your entanglement. And this is a theory that has been developed in the group of Peter Zoller. Uh, actually, before I arrived there, it was 98. And experiment has been performed, as I mentioned before, by Manuel Bloch and other people in Munich and in other places around the world. And this was the basis, for instance, for this quantum simulator that last year you know, uh, broke the threshold of performance of a classical computer. Still, I mean, it would seem that one knows how to build a quantum computer because now we have all these ingredients so we can do it. And in fact, there are people who claim that they can build such quantum computer. Uh, I know that some of us come from Canada, so they know this. And in fact, the first time I was preparing this uh, talk for, actually it was a talk at ITAM that I gave a few years ago, uh, I noticed on the New York Times um, this um, article here, and actually, Professor Lukin, who was listening to the, was attending the talk, asked whether it was the fan pages of the New York Times uh, that uh, listed this article. Actually, it was not the fan pages, it was the business pages, because of course there can be some economic interest here, but this was not the full title, because we know that there may be some questions whether these people really have realized a quantum computer, and it is still open, it can be very interesting, but at the moment there is no evidence that they can do that, nor is there any evidence that anyone can do a general purpose quantum computer. We have evidence in the meantime of the quantum simulator, but for the general purpose quantum computer, we do not yet know. And the reason is that, uh, again, you go to the experimentalist, you say, I have a fantastic idea for quantum computers. What do they do? They start complaining. So there are practical problems, and problems that concern 
uh, uh, for instance, the implementation that I showed you are not just some experimentalist complaint, they are very serious uh, uh, complaints because when you have to transport atoms around, then this means that you are exciting some motion, there is some thermal excitation, there is something going on that you need to control. On the other hand, you need maybe to address, as I said, single qubits in, in an array, which is also non trivial. In general, you have the problem that you want your system to listen just to you, you are telling him what to do, and he or she, I don't know whether the system is female or, 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 or masculine, but nevertheless, this guy, okay, has to listen to you and not to anything else. But how does the guy know that you is you because you are sitting in the environment, okay? So you have to teach him. How do you do that? This is very non-trivial. So <clears throat> here is where quantum optimal control theory comes in. Because you must know that, well, we do know that uh, for every problem in uh, theoretical physics, there always is a Russian that solved it uh, 40 years ago, right? And this is no exception. Actually, I used this, uh, this statement even long before I went to Kremlin to discuss these things. Uh, and actually, uh, there was in Stalingrad, okay, there was Office of Optimal Control. And that meant really optimal control of everything. Yeah? Um, so they have a set of techniques developed to control very complex systems. And those were classical systems, but nevertheless, you can use those ideas and some of our um, colleagues and pioneers in this field have learned how to use some of these ideas and developed new ideas to uh, control processes in quantum chemistry. For instance, in laser-assisted molecular reactions and in other uh, processes in quantum chemical physics. And the idea is, I want my system to do something that it would not like to do normally, something non-typical. So, I mean, I don't care what a system would do normally. A system normally would decohere very quickly, okay? I just want to see, is there any one single path in my parameter space, in my Hilbert space, that does the job for me? A plane would typically crash. It is, you know, a plane is a large, massive object, okay? Only if, especially one very high-speed military plane, okay? would crash even you know, though there is Bernoulli, but you know, instabilities at such high speed are so huge that if you wouldn't have feedback control and a lot of controls on it, typical behavior of such physical object would be destruction. But you can pick one specific part in parameter space such that the guy flies and even reaches its goal. Okay? And this is where all these ideas in classical control um, are useful, and so the question is can we apply them to quantum context, and this it is really thanks to people like Hirsch and, and others that we know now that we can apply them to control. So what I uh, am doing for my part is I'm just using those ideas and taking them to application in some context where they can be uh, used, for instance, for quantum processing. And then of course here at the bottom comes always the experiment and says, oh yes, but it won't work. You know, because there is noise, because uh, because the uh, system is uh, decoherent, because you give me some very special path in parameter space, but it will never work. And, uh, you know, our statement has been for a few years, no, 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 okay, give me your noise source, and I will do the, the math, and I will give you a path that works with that noise source. And still, not everybody was, was um, believing that, but lately, let's say in the last year, uh, several people have started using these ideas and have started doing experiments with our optimized pulses, people including Emmanuel Bloch, Jörg Spielmeier, Indiana, uh, and other colleagues uh, uh, all over the place, who are now having very high fidelities in several quantum processes using these quantum control ideas in real experimental situations. So there is really a lot of possibility to use these ideas to be robust to noise, and what they want to do is to give you examples of how this can work. So, the big question is now, what can we do? What is possible? We have a certain task that we want to perform. Can we perform that? And here comes my favorite example of an empirical view of control. And here is my, my guy here. So, <clears throat> now let me explain a little bit uh, what I mean by that. So, let's assume that you know, 
well, let's assume that uh, I, I cannot go back there because, because it was saying it basically my, my chair here. But uh, let's assume that Pierre is my chair in, in this session. And I want to get his favor because I want uh, two hours more for my lecture. Okay. So this is not non trivial task, right? I have to give him some benefit for that. So I, I have some uh, behind here, I have some source <coughs> of cold champagne. And so I want to bring this cold champagne to, to Pierre, but to please him, I need to have huge quantity of champagne. Okay, because I want to do it. So I need to, I have this tray with huge quantity of champagne, and I need to bring it to him. But I am quite clumsy, right? And it is very clear because I'm a theoretical physicist. So what do I do? I choose a diabolic strategy. Yeah? So I have my, 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 my tray of champagne glasses, and then I will very slowly move towards Pierre, so that I will not excite any motion in my champagne, okay? And slowly, slowly, but steadily, I will arrive to, to Pierre. But by the time I am with Pierre, since there is environment, okay, we are in Arizona, southern uh, state, so uh, there is environment, and champagne is no longer cold. So he doesn't want it, and he cuts 20 minutes out of my talk. So then I say, I have to improve, okay? I'm a learning system, I have to improve. So I get some more champagne, and I will start so, in the beginning, I had a very slow run, you know, time dependence. You know, very slow time dependence. I started linearly with a very slow, <coughs> low slow. Now I say, I have to get there earlier than that, otherwise he won't give me my two hours. So I take a linear run, and I start like this, and I do that. And I go to Pierre, but by the time I am in the middle of the room, my fidelity has dropped, in the following sense that half of my glasses are on the floor because they dropped, because the motion that I excited with the initial kink in my motion has <coughs> gotten rid of most of them, okay? But I am still a learning system, so I can start wondering, okay, now what did I do wrong? How could I improve, right? And I could try and improve, or I could even be more clever and go to some Russian, or maybe to some uh, real waiter who can teach me. I can get private lessons. And then if I get private lessons from a waiter, then I will learn how to do that. And if you observe how a real way to do that, you can notice also a little bit of that in, in the picture, they will start like this. They will incline the guy, and then they go like this, and then they de-incline it, okay? So they have some additional excitation. Because <coughs> I mean, if in the beginning I would just incline and do this excitation, then the fidelity would drop instantly to the floor. But if I combine that, I have two control parameters, I accelerate and deaccelerate, and I have a lot of excitation in between, it is non adiabatic but in the end, I can get to the ground state. In a short time, I wanted fast operation, okay, because I want Pierre to drink my two liters of champagne uh, when it is still very cold, okay? And it is in the ground state, I have not spilled it. But <clears throat> in order to be able to do that, I need really to, to be an optimal control process, meaning, you know, first time, it won't work. You have a certain guess, it will fail me. However, you can retry and you can improve. And once you've learned how to do that, and once you, you know really how your, your system reacts, you have to develop a feeling, you know? Not all tilting, not all tilting angles for your train are fine. Not all possible velocities are fine, okay? You have to see what is the, the best you can do. But once you know your stuff, you can do really amazing things. But the most important thing of all is you never forget to tilt your train. So you have some control, <coughs> use them, okay? If I didn't tilt my train, I would never reach uh, Pierre in time. And so this is what, uh, this is why this, this picture is so dear to me, because it really contains all, of, all there is to, um, to know about control, and now the rest is just going to some Russian cookbook and, and finding a recipe to, to do that, or maybe developing your own RSP, as I will show you in my third lecture. So, the question is, nevertheless, is it possible at all to achieve the process that I wanted to achieve, okay? For instance, I mean, if I wanted to bring my, my champagne with superluminal velocity to Pierre, there are some laws of physics which forbid that, okay? So I can only do it some limited velocity. In general, you know, I can have a, an arbitrary complex problem. Here is a problem which, uh, you know, I come from Italy, as you hear from my accent, and I was giving this talk in Russia, so there are some common problems there. So there is a huge mess in traffic. It is not like uh, uh, Arizona or California where, you know, parking lots uh, are, you know, twice as big as 
as your car in Russia or in Italy you have you know epsilon parking spot is epsilon longer than, than your car and you have a problem of transverse parking so you are sitting in your car you have you have your champagne in the trunk which you have to bring to, to, to deliver to Pierre and then you, you, you think how can I do that will I be able to do that transversely okay so when you sit there since you are a theoretical physicist what do you do obviously you check your dynamic area and you say, okay, is my system controllable? Can I ever possibly be doing that? What does this mean? I have some operations that I can do. I can go back and forth, I can turn my wheel. By composing those operations, will I be able to do this transverse thing? And in fact, yes, you are able. But the question is, okay, you are able, but I mean, how long will it take? You expect some sort of inverse epsilon scaling. <coughs> tiny for this. And if you want fast operation, <coughs> then you need to make sure that you can do the best. And here is where controllability theory helps you and where optimization can tell you how to realize something. This was classical. Here comes a quantum example. Quantum, I mean, we can have a discrete state. I start from an initial state. I want to get to a goal state after a while. And, you know, if I have no couplings among these states, I cannot possibly do that. So what do I need? Well, I need to see whether my Hamiltonian gives me some such couplings. But still, if my natural Hamiltonian is not give, is giving me only these couplings that I depict here, I won't be able to go from initial to goal state. Now, <clears throat> if instead I create some additional couplings, and here comes my wiggling, my exciting, my doing something, my switching on laser, my you know doing some control, then I can have you know a situation in which I could have you know, a path from the initial to the goal state. For instance, I could have this blue path, or I could have a green path. And now, which one is the best, right? Well, it depends. Depends on whether I'm interested in fidelity, whether I'm interested in <coughs> speed, what is the trade-off that I have to strike, okay? And <coughs> this is what uh, our methods of quantum optimal control are about. Finding, defining what is, what costs more, what is more worth, and then trying to reach there in the best possible way. So, one very important way, as I already mentioned, to achieve this is using wiggles. Okay? So here come uh, a couple examples of wiggles from classical control. So here is a single wiggle. Okay, we start uh, slow, because this is a winter school, and I'm told, go slow. So I'm going slow. In particular, there are two slow moving you know, balls rolling on uh, two guides. And <clears throat> these guides, one is completely flat, gravity goes downwards, and the other one has a single wiggle, single modulation in the height, okay? And then the question that one asks is, <clears throat> okay, I release both balls with same velocity, okay? This is a conservative system, potential energy in the end is going to be the same, so same kinetic energy uh, in the end as well. So, what happens? Normally, students say, well, due to energy conservation, at least my students in Germany, they say, due to energy conservation, it's a draw, because kinetic energy is the same, velocity is the same, nothing, I mean, there is no advantage there, because it is a, uh, uh, gravity is a conservative force. Or, maybe some, some very smart students will say, oh yes, but this ball here has a shorter path, right? So it will arrive first. And of course, uh, I wouldn't uh, put up this transparency if the answer was the other, wasn't the other one, yeah? And then of course, uh, I mean, after you, you, you see it, you, you say, of course, it's the other one. And to convince you, of course, YouTube is very fashionable now, so I went to YouTube, there's a Chinese video here, which convinces you that this is the case. So it goes. And then Chinese, nice Chinese people put it uh, twice as slow, so you really can see. And then say, of course, trivia, you know, trivia. <laughs> Why? No, of course, I mean, here they have the same velocity, and of course here it gets accelerated. So in this part of the this, in this part of the trajectory, it goes faster, so it gets there earlier. Yeah, trivia. But this tells you something non-trivial, which is, I pick one deformation in parameter space, and then I can get better to where I wanted to, to get, okay? So this is one single wiggle, but we can have also many wiggles. And here is something which is maybe the less trivial. 
again, you know, some Russian guy here. <coughs> so here you have a problem of an inverted pendulum. Of course, you can solve an inverted pendulum by a feedback, you know. Everyone is able to balance a broom upside down, you know, with your finger, just by watching, and even maybe not watching, but sort of feeling, and when the broom, you know, tends to fall in that direction, I will accelerate in this direction, back and forth. Okay, so I can balance. But, uh, you know, we want more. We would like a control process such that I can balance this upside down without feedback. Okay? <clears throat> so this is an inverted pendulum. Can I do that? And yes, of course, I can do that via some wiggles. Like if I shake this with some periodic um, uh, regulation, <coughs> what happens here, different curves from, for different amplitudes of the periodic modulation, I modulate this, the, the basis, the, the hanging point of this pendulum, and what I get is an alternative minimum around the inverted position. Okay? So this, it is possible by a very simple control, shaking this guy, to put it upside down. So here is a loudspeaker, I put in a 5 kilohertz whistle in here, and then this stick, which is, you know, uh, can rotate around this point here, stays upside down. And uh, this is even taking care of one particular experimental complaint. Because normal experimenters say, oh yes, no, but your control, it needs to be very accurate. You deviate from that, it will not work. Not true. Here you have a minimum, okay? Meaning that, you know, this wiggling is stabilizing my system against perturbation. I can touch this guy, it will, if I, if I, if I just blow it away, of course it will go out of equilibrium. But if I touch it a little bit, it will be stabilized back into equilibrium upside down, and this is without any feedback. Meaning, I can have, without closed loop, you know, I can tell you what an optimal shape for some control parameter is, and my guy will do some non-trivial thing that I would not expect it to do, okay? So, <clears throat> this is, this was the classical version, and I think I have minus 30 seconds until the end of my talk, and so maybe I can uh, perhaps just <coughs> show you the analog to connect it to this uh, you know, optical lattice problem that I showed before. Here, I'm considering an initial state, uh, which in my optical lattice is actually the atom in one of the wells, as I said before. I have some Hamiltonian which depends on the temperature <coughs> parameter, you know, this distance between the two potentials for 1 and for 0, which I can control, as I said, by my lasers. And then I have some evolved state. After a certain time, the guys come together, potential in the middle, and I want them to be in the middle, in the ground state, right? So I want to minimize my error, I want to maximize my fidelity, and in this case my fidelity is the projection of the state that I obtain after my evolution onto the state I wanted. <coughs> and it's very similar to the to counting my glasses on the tray. Because I have something after some non-trivial evolution, which is not exactly what I wanted, and there is also something that I wanted. Perfect state, you know, all, all uh, glasses served to Pierre at the end. I want to minimize that error. Can I do that? Well, I can do that with quantum control, but uh, this uh, with to keep suspense, I will announce and show that tomorrow. Thank you.